grandfather was also born in England, and he, my, he and his family migrated to Canada when he was six years old. He was one of ten boys. He was number eight of those ten boys. And so he had lots of brothers above him to do lots of things, whether they were to teach him something or whether they were to uh, be brothers. Be brothers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to put it, <laughs> to just be brothers. But the thing that my grandfather had that seemed to get everybody very interested was the fact that he was really smart really smart, but he loved nature. He wanted to be part of nature. And whenever he could, he would escape to the woods because he didn't really like his father and he needed to escape from his brothers being brothers. But during those early years when they were homesteading, he learned, they all learned how to use tools, which is where woodcraft became his focus. And he would escape to the woods and be able to make a fire and build his own little house. He built his house called Glenyon. Okay, so Glenyon means Jan's Glen. His name, his middle name was Evan. He was born Ernest Evan Thompson. And he liked to change his name a lot. <laughs> and it's funny because in the documentation that I have from um, publishers throughout the years, he wrote 43 books. There's a note. Gee, he sure likes to change his yeah. name a lot. <laughs> it's, it's actually in the book. It was pretty funny to find. Um, and so he created his own little space that he could escape to. And he did that, he built that in, when he was about 15 years old. And one day when he went there, he discovered that there were three tramps in it. And they had trashed his home. And he was devastated. But he couldn't tell his father about it because his father didn't want him to do anything having to do with nature. And so he forbid him to have a gun, to go out into nature, but he went anyway because he tended to go against the grain quite a bit. And he didn't get in trouble at school so much, but he certainly got in trouble at home. And he got one of his brothers to play with him and he was able to go back to Glenyon and he found a dead hawk. Now he was a really good artist and he always loved to draw the birds, but he didn't know what the names of those birds were. And he desperately wanted to know them and there was a book that he really wanted to get, but it was a what? Nature book. So he couldn't ask his father for the money. So he started doing all kinds of chores. He was making insect cages and selling them to a woman who wanted them for her brother in England. And he was just about, the book that he wanted cost a dollar. And he'd gotten to 90 cents and it took him another two months to get that last dime. He was very, very worried. So he goes into the, sh the shop. He said, do you have Mr. Ross's or Dr. Ross's book on birds? Why, yes. Would you like the green cover or the brown cover? And he was so amazed. He said, well, the green cover. And he said, that'll be 90 cents. <laughs> what do you mean 90 cents? He learned a lesson about using cash versus using credit. <laughs> and he learned and at that point he thought hmm I can use this for a whole lot of things and so he went off to England to become an artist he studied in London and he got a seven-year scholarship at the Royal Academy of Art unfortunately uh, he only used about a year of it because he was so intense on in his studies that he wasn't taking care of himself so he got very, very ill. And his cousin called, or wrote to his mother and said, he, got, he has to come home because he's going to die. So they shipped him home just before his 21st birthday. So as he was recovering, his father, and he, he turned 21, 
And his father called him into his office and said, all right, you owe everything you've ever done to me and your mother. And you need to pay us back. Here is the bill for every single dime they had spent on him, including the doctor's fees when he was born. Uh huh. Oh, I can't do that. Well, oh, and by the way, I haven't charged any interest to date, but from now on, it's six percent interest until it's all paid off. <clears throat> well, you—he already didn't get along with his father, so this kind of pushed it over. So he had to go out and find a job, and it was. His, his birthday is in August, and he found a company that wanted him to make Christmas cards. And so he started drawing, he drew birds. And he drew 12 birds and got $5 a piece for these birds, for drawing those, for drawing those cards. And that's what started him on his own path to be his own man, and to be able to use his artwork and his love of nature together. And then as soon as he had enough money, he thought, oh, well, I'm going to just pay him off all, all at once. He said, wait a minute. No, I don't need to do that. I'm going to save some of it and go to my brothers who are now in Manitoba and homestead in Manitoba with my brothers. And off he went with cattle, and, not with cattle, I'm sorry, with chickens and geese and, yes, and a pig, I think. <laughs> anyway, so he goes and he, and he creates his own world as a naturalist, teaching himself to do this on his own. And he, so he started to develop, to develop this, this idea about life, <coughs> and that everything alive is born pure as pure as God can make it. And therefore, children don't need to be reformed. They need to be prevented from being deformed. And that was the beginning of his philosophy of youth education, <coughs> nature-based, and that people needed to learn. He took a group of, of boys from New York out into the woods. Yeah, come on out, we're gonna go and have some we're gonna have a great time, we're gonna go play. He put them out into the woods and, he, and about an hour later, he went looking around for them. <laughs> and they were smoking cigarettes and shooting dice. And he realized that just because somebody's out in nature doesn't mean they're gonna enjoy it. They don't know how to enjoy it. And so he learned that they needed to be taught. And that's where his scouting activities, as he called it, Woodcraft, the Woodcraft Indians, started in 1902. And for two years before that, he had been working with this group of vandals who were destroying his property. And so he created the Woodcraft Indians. And it was this series of articles that were being published in the Ladies Home Journal. So in 1904, it, that program actually moved over to England. <clears throat> and the first Woodcraft Indians group was set up in, in Eccles, and then three others followed. And then in, 2000, in, in 1906, he had an opportunity to meet with Baden Powell. <coughs> Baden Powell came to his hotel, to the Savoy Hotel on the 30th of October, 1906. And they spent several hours talking together about, about youth education and what, how to do it and, and all of these ideas. And they were going to work together to make it happen. But it didn't quite work that way. And in 1908, the Boy Scouts in England began. Now in 2010, or 1910, keep getting, I'm sorry. Um, in 1910, the Boy Scouts signed off, became a charter in February, but the organization wasn't completed yet. 
The organizational structure for the Boy Scouts of America did not start until 1911, which is when my grandfather became Chief Scout, officially. He was already part of the organizing committee. He was the lead of the organizing committee. They were already out doing a lot of recruitment. There were woodcrafters and other groups that were all trying to get youth to belong to their organization. So this, on the, on the US side of the world, this was a race. Which organization was going to become the premier organization, the national premier organization for youth education? There were 38 groups that, he, that my grandfather knew of. So he invited them all to come and become part of the Boy Scouts. Bring your boys with you and you will become a council member. You will, your name will be on the letterhead. And all but one group did. Now, does that mean that all of the, those other groups ceased to be? Not necessarily, because you didn't have to be anything exclusive. Just as in England, when Baden-Powell was trying to get his activities into other organizations because they were already established, Seton saw the value of that as well. And so that's how scouting came to be. My grandfather left the scouts in 1915. Uh, they, were, they were trying to get a federal charter. And there was a little pushback because my grandfather was still a Canadian citizen. He was still a British citizen. Well, how can a Brit how can somebody not American be in charge of the Boy Scouts of America? But they also ab abolished the position Chief Scout, and it became the Chief Scout Executive. <clears throat> that happened in January of 1915. In July of 1915, my grandfather received a letter from President the President of the Boy Scouts of America, Colin Livingstone, saying, thank you for your service. You are no longer part of the Boy Scouts of America. Wow. There was a lot of problem with that because there was so, he had invested so much. Well, they left quietly because if there had been a big stink, now you're all looking like, wow, we didn't never know that. Well, guess why? It's because it was not to be talked about, because it would hurt the organization. And so what, what I take out of all of this is that these men, these men and women, because there were women involved as well, who had different ideas about doing the exact same thing, and that same thing was to create an organization that created good character so that they would grow up to be good adults that would serve their communities. And all of these different, org these pieces, and they all shaped it. So if you think about how a sculpture works, a sculptor works, and it's chisel and chisel and, and pat and throw out and push back and, and create, and what's what we have now <coughs> is the Boy Scouts of America, Scouts USA, that is a combination of a hundred years of that molding. It is an excellent program. And the words that my grandfather said more than a hundred years ago, the number one thing that's important in America is the character of our youth. We've got to do something about it. And you are. <laughs>